All right. Good morning. Um, excited to be here with you all. I've been to Thunder Plains in person. I'm not going to lie. It's way better that way. Um, but I'm really excited that the organizers were able to pull something together. Um, you know, organizing a conference alone is one thing, but then trying to do it amidst a pandemic and completely shift to an online platform um, is, is no small feat. Uh, so definitely want to say, you know, shout out to the organizers for doing an amazing job and make sure to show them your appreciation. Um, if you can ever share a beer with them again. <laughs> um, but today I'm going to be talking about how there are no snow days when you work remote. Um, I've given this talk um, a couple times over the years. Uh, I've been working remote for the last couple of years of my career. And traditionally in the past when I've given this talk, it's, you know, hey, how do you decide if working remote is right for you? Um, how do you figure out if your employer can support that? Or how do you find a job? Well, times are a bit different where we're kind of working remote, whether we like it or not. Um, so I wanted to kind of shift gears and, and give you all strategies to survive. Uh, a little bit more about me. Uh, my name is Jennifer Wadella. You can follow me on Twitter at like OMG at Spetty. Um, nine to five, I do work um, as the director of uh, Angular development at a consulting company called Batovi. Um, Batovi has been a remote company for 14 years. So um, it's kind of very baked into the way we do everything. Um, <clears throat> run a nonprofit on the side, that being a volunteer organization has basically always been uh, remote uh, along with having some asynchronous communication. Um, so that's kind of developed a lot of the strategies that I have. I, I feel like it's worth, uh, before we talk about working remote, reminding you um, of this really great, great quote that you're not working from home, you are at your home during a crisis trying to work. Um, these are unprecedented times. This is very different for a lot of people. Um, and so I think it's important to have this context of you may not be as productive as you were pre-pandemic because we are dealing with so many more things on an emotional level, um, on a community support level. Uh, and so I think this is a good reminder that everybody needs to hear as they're trying to, to balance this new lifestyle. And I think it's worth calling out that some of us are a little bit more prepared for this lifestyle than others. Um, I don't know if you grew up like me, but I was a freaking nerd on the internet, which meant I spent my evenings hanging out in IRC with my friends, playing Counter-Strike, talking over video chat. Um, we were using AOL Instant Messenger, you know, for most of my, my time on the internet. Um, so this idea of asynchronous communication, this idea of being able to communicate and collaborate with people um, outside of an office environment has not been that big of a shift for me personally. Um, but that's not the case for everybody. Uh, if you're working at companies, a lot of these people um, are going to have roles outside of tech and they're not as well versed in some of these communication strategies. And so it's worth being aware um, that, you know, not everybody has had your experience, if your experience reflects mine, of this internet communication uh, and, and figuring out how to utilize all these online tools to be productive. I think it's also worth calling out that um, we do need to check on the extroverts in our lives. Myself as an introvert, um, I am again, completely fine being on my own. I'm that kind of person that I can give a conference talk and then I need to go like chill out in my hotel room and just have some time to myself. Um, so, you know, being alone in my office, not a really big deal for me, but the, uh, the extroverts are struggling. Um, so I think if we can all find a little bit of, of compassion and empathy and kind of reach out to those extroverts, maybe give them a little bit of that social interaction, even if it's just in an online sense, um, that will kind of help everybody stay, stay in a good place. Uh, but to the core of this talk, um, kind of want to treat it as a remote survival guide. And I'm going to couple, cover a couple things. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk at like, you know, a micro level, the strategies that you can implement as a person um, to be successful. Uh, there's an amount of self-discipline that's required transitioning to working to remote. So what are strategies that you can execute as a person? Uh, and then I think it's also important to just be aware that even if you execute all these strategies and you're the best remote employee on the face of the planet, that doesn't mean your, your employer or your company is going to be in a position to recognize that or even um, be able to provide you a, a good um, environment to do that within. Um, so I want to kind of give you some strategies as well to protect yourself um, if your employer has not handled this transition to remote work well, what are some things you can do um, to kind of manage up and uh, create a positive change? And then just an ongoing reminder to practice self-care. Um, this has been a rough year. We keep thinking, you know, what else can go wrong? The, the highlights of this year have been very few and far in between. One of those highlights for me has been Emily in Paris on Netflix. I'm, I am diving deeply into trashy TV to save my sanity. 
Um, but it's okay to practice self-care. And if that means, you know, drinking pumpkin spice lattes all season long, cause it feels like March was six months. Like that's completely okay. If you're putting up your Christmas tree right now, because you have nothing better to do, you know, more power to you, whatever you can do to, to keep yourself in, in a good mindset rules be damned. Um, so that's what I want to cover, uh, in, in this next, uh, session with you all. So when we talk about strategies to be an, uh, remote, an effective remote worker, I have kind of a couple of rules that I want to break down for you um, or a couple of strategies. And the first strategy uh, is creating a productive environment. And so this uh, is, is different depending on your situation. Me having worked remote already, I have a completely separate office in my house. Um, like I have a desk here, I have a nice chair, like I have a lot of um, graces that I've been able to prepare and get ready because I know that I am working remote and I was able to um, have my house with that in mind. Not everybody is in that situation. Not everybody um, has an office to work from. Um, and so you still need to focus on creating an, uh, an office environment. So this can mean establishing an office area. Um, and it's really important to create visual boundaries for yourself and for others. So when establishing an office area, maybe it's, you know, at the kitchen table, um, having some sort of setting, having some sort of wall or some sort of indicator that this is your workspace right now um, is a really powerful strategy to say, hey, I'm in work mode. Like, yes, this is not a typical work room of my house, but let me create some visual cues for myself or for others in my life to recognize that this is my office area. Um, I do recommend maintaining a clean office environment. We are very much like The Sims, where when things are messy, we can get a little bit grumpy. Um, and so making sure that you have a clean office environment uh, can help you be more productive. So as much as you can, kind of focus on that. Uh, if you are lucky enough to have kind of more of a, an established office area, I would definitely encourage you to pimp your office. Um, make it a space that you enjoy being, make it a space that you feel productive in, whether it's having like a nice keyboard, uh, whether it's having, I'm a huge plant lady, so I love being surrounded by green. It makes me feel a little bit better, um, but do what you can. And I know a lot of us have transitioned uh, to remote. We feel like we need all these different things. We need fancy webcams. We need fancy microphones. And unless you're a content creator, I really don't think it's that necessary. And uh, like basic logic tech um, video cameras are still vastly overpriced on Amazon right now. It's absurd to go out and think you need to buy all these things when you can use, you know, most laptops have built-in webcams, that kind of thing. Um, so create an office environment that's comfortable for you, but do not feel like you need to um, keep up with the, the Joneses when it comes to buying fancy equipment. Um, it's also worth reaching out to your employer and saying, hey, have we thought about a budget? Um, like, you know, can I buy an, a, a nice office chair so I'm not having a lot of back issues so I can, you know, make sure that um, I'm, I'm taking care of myself. Um, so those are completely reasonable requests. I think it's also important to follow a dress code and get dressed every day. Whether this is like you have a rotating set of comfy pajamas, that is completely fine. But I think it is important to think about getting dressed um, and also be aware of who you're going to be meeting with that day. Like if I'm just talking with my um, my coworkers and, and my team and helping them um, troubleshoot problems, like I'm going to be wearing a t-shirt and a hoodie. If I'm meeting with a client, I know I have a sales call or something like that. I'm definitely going to kind of dress up to manage expectations. Um, but definitely follow a dress code like do your laundry, um, try and keep up habits like that. So strategy number two um, is establishing and maintaining boundaries. And so this kind of relates to this idea of creating a separate office space. Um, because when you start working remote, people think that because you're in the house, that means you're available to go to the grocery store or to solve this problem or do this or do that. Um, and so one thing that you need to do to safeguard yourself and your time is making sure that you're doing a very good job at establishing and maintaining boundaries. Um, this doesn't just mean for like your family members in the house. This also means for you personally. Uh, so you need to maintain office hours. Uh, working from home, it's really hard because you are home to make sure that you are stepping away from your desk at the end of the day and stepping away fully. Um, so one of the best things you can do is start and end your day at consistent times. Um, if people would expect to be able to stop by your desk and find you at an office at a certain time, make sure you're available, um, you know, online during those times. And at the end of the day, leave your desk. Um, if you're in a situation where you can't have a desk, you can't have an office space, like let's say you're working at the kitchen table, clear your laptop away, clear things away, set the kitchen table, make it very clear that you are away from your desk and, and you're focusing on other things in your life. Boundaries are important. Um, another boundary is taking a lunch break. Uh, it's important again to keep up with routine. So eat your food, go for a walk, browse Reddit, do something that's going to keep you away from the keyboard. 
Um, one of the things that I've been struggling with a lot, a lot is I love playing video games, um, but that is a lot of screen time. And even though it's something I do to relax, sometimes I have to physically go outside just to get that mental break to get away from the screen time. Um, so make sure that you're taking breaks. Um, if you're, you know, trying to keep up with your gym routine, go for a walk, go do some, some pull-ups. So I know I've seen a lot of people start to really pimp out their, their home workout um, things, but make sure you're prioritizing breaks for that. Um, so a big part of this is explaining your boundaries to family and friends. Uh, one of the best things you can do if you're in the situation too is use a closed door as possible. That is a very clear indicator. Hey, I'm in work mode right now. Please don't disturb me. Um, if that's not possible, you need to have a very um, visual indication of, of when you're working and when not to be interrupted. Um, so maybe that's putting up like a, a cute little sign. You can get those plastic um, sign containers that you can fit like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper in um, really cheap at Office Max. So you can maybe have a sign, hey, mommy is working right now. Hey, daddy is working right now. Um, and use that as a visual indicator for people of when they're allowed to engage with you. Um, I would also recommend, especially for relationships, to have a special code word or phrase for when you want to scream, I'm working right now, leave me alone. Um, if you can work on some sort of communication phrase with your partner um, that comes off a little less harsh, but like um, lets them know, hey, don't bother me right now, that can be something to uh, help uh, save you for some sanity in your relationship while you're cohabitating. Another boundary is to become a time zone pro. Um, this may not matter for everybody who's, uh, you know, been in a single office, so you're mostly all in the same area code, but we've been remote for long enough now that people are kind of starting to disperse. They're getting a little stir crazy. Maybe people are exploring working from different areas. So become a time zone pro. Um, this also means that just because you're in, you're at your house and just because technically you're available, you can meet doesn't mean you should. Um, so for example, I have clients, I'm in central time, like a lot of you are, um, I've got clients in East coast time. I've got clients in, um, West coast time and yeah, like sometimes the West coast client will ping me at six o'clock at night. And technically I could be available, but I try to do a really good job balancing and saying, nope, I'm, I'm having dinner with my partner right now. Like this is me time. And so it's okay to establish those boundaries. Um, if you're somebody who's struggling with matching up time zones, there's actually a really cool way to add a secondary time zone to Google Outlook or Google Calendar, or excuse me, Outlook or Google Calendar. Um, so there are a lot of tools that can kind of help you aid in this process. So you're not having to do that mental math in your head. I, uh, I really screwed myself over uh, back when we were pre-pandemic and I was doing a conference uh, in Australia and I booked a client meeting and I did the time zone in reverse and I ended up having to get, like, get up at 4.30 in the morning and I was like, oh, okay, deep regrets. Um, so learning to facilitate time zones is great. Strategy number three, um, avoid remote traps. And so I feel like these are going to catch a lot of people um, new to working remote and get caught up in the glamour of, oh, I can work from home. I can do everything because I'm here. Not a great idea. Um, so a trap uh, for working remote is not showering. I definitely recommend for you to shower every day. It kind of goes back to that Sims idea, right? Like we're going to be happier when we're clean and we're not smelling in the people around us are going to be a lot happier too. So please shower every day. Keep that as a part of your routine. If it wasn't a part of your routine before, uh, we might have to have a couple other discussions, um, but cleanliness is, is good. Um, another big trap people don't realize is, is doing chores. Um, don't do them during the, your office hours. Uh, they can really corrupt your attention span. And I feel like the worst violator of this is laundry. Oh, sorry about that. Um, Laundry is one of those things where, okay, you put it in the washer and you know it's going to go for a certain amount of time. And then you're going to be thinking, oh, okay, is that done? Because I need to get it into the dryer right away or it's going to smell like mildew. Oh, if your dryer is not that great, you might have to check and run the cycles again. And that's the kind of chore that is going to be pulling your attention span. Um, so really try and not do, chore even though you can, even though you're home, try not to do things like that that are going to corrupt your attention span from what you should be working on. Um, Slack, social media, and other things are, are very big distractions that are huge traps. Um, if you're the kind of person who doesn't have a lot of self-discipline, there are a lot of great blockers and tools that I recommend. Um, so Momentum is a great one. And this is a um, Chrome plugin. And I'm notoriously bad. Let's say like I start running unit tests. I know they're going to take a minute. Um, I'll just, you know, command N, which will pop up a new tab in, in Chrome. And I start typing in Twitter. Well, Momentum will kind of pop up this nice screen with a nice photo and be like, hello, Jennifer what would you like to accomplish today? And I'm like, you know what, Momentum, you're right. I should not browse Twitter because it's a black hole and I will be in that black hole for an hour after my unit tests are finished running. So there are a lot of really great tools. Um, another one of them I like a lot is Forest. 
Um, it is this little, uh, basically Pomodoro timer in your Chrome plugin. And if you really want to focus, like let's say for a 15 minute increment, you click that and a little tree starts growing. And if you go anywhere you're supposed to do or, or get off task, you're going to kill your tree. And so it's, it's a little disappointing um, and something that's maybe a little bit more motivating to keep you on track. Um, and then there's also tools like Stay Focused, which will literally just not allow you to visit any sites that you specify. And so that's like, you know, really hardcore. Oh, I have no self-control. I'm just not even going to give myself the ability to access. So tons of great options there to make sure that you are able to stay focused. Um, another trap I see a lot is people working from bed. Um, and so this sounds great. Like, you know, you can just lounge back against your headboard and be on your computer. But this really makes it hard to distinguish boundaries. Like, keep your bed as a place for sleeping, um, keep your bed as a place for uh, a space for you and your partner. Uh, if you have a partner, um, try and distinguish those areas. If you're in a completely devastating case where literally your bedroom is the only place that you can get away to work, um, see what you can do about setting up your room, whether it's getting a small desk, whether it's getting some sort of tray and maybe even change your, your bedding to say, all right, this is like the work comforter. This is when I'm in work mode. So you can maintain some elements of boundaries. Strategy number four, um, being visible in the company. Uh, and so, you know, you're completely losing this, this idea of a tangible person uh, when you're working remote. And so sometimes it's hard to have that connection with people. Um, and so I think it's important to let people know that, hey, you're still there, you're still working, you're still available as a resource, you're still being productive. Um, so checking in with your team is a part of this. Um, it's completely okay to say, even if you're doing just like a daily Slack stand up where you just post your status, um, having that visual check in with your team instead of everybody kind of being lost into the internet void um, is a really good way to just maintain contact and make sure everybody's um, kind of in sync with each other. Um, make other people aware of your progress, be maybe a little bit more vocal around ticket process, ticket progress or blockers or things um, as you run into them. And then a really big one is letting other people know when you're, you're being um, away from your keyboard. Uh, so you can use status messages in Slack if, if that's your platform, um, but just make people aware, hey, I'm not going to be available right now. That way they're not trying to get a hold of you and you're not responding. They're like, hmm, is this person actually working? Basically, you want to be as transparent as you can. Um, there's a little bit of discomfort, especially at the management level that we'll talk about more with not being able to visually see people getting their work done. Um, so the more you can do to kind of um, be very vocal, hey, this is what I'm working on. Hey, here's what's going on. The more comfortable people are going to feel. Uh, another part of this is, is getting comfortable asking for help. Uh, it's a little bit difficult when you're you know, in a remote environment to see if somebody's struggling or to feel like, you know, it's okay to approach somebody. You can't just walk by their desk and be like, hey, are you busy? I'm struggling with this problem. Could you help me? Um, you need to get comfortable saying, hey, I need somebody's help, whether it's pinging in general chat and saying, hey, has anybody encountered this issue before or directly messaging somebody and saying, hey, I know you have domain knowledge in this area. Um, can I put some time on your calendar to help me through this issue? Uh, it doesn't have to be all just work though. Um, you know, find fun ways to contribute to your team culture um, in this remote life. Uh, Midwest Dev Chat, if you're in there, uh, we had a channel where we were just like doing this ridiculous unicorn Fibonacci thing. Like, you know, understand that you can be fun and you can bring your personality and you can have a good time online. It doesn't have to be just work, 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 work all the time. This helps build team culture. Uh, strategy number five. Engage with your local tech community. Um, and this has gotten a lot easier since uh, you literally don't have to leave your house. Um, but I think it's still important to maintain that sense of community. And I know we all have Zoom fatigue, like I definitely do. Um, but it's, I think it's important to kind of like try and maintain uh, those, those uh, communities that we're a part of, uh, whether it's speaking, whether it's just getting together and kind of talking through people, because that is still how we share knowledge. And that is still how we get better as a developer community. Um, if there weren't communities you were part of before, uh, there's this huge list of tech community slacks that are available by location or by interest. Um, so you can definitely jump into some Slack communities, uh, get some engagement going on there. Um, you know, a lot of user groups have made the transition to remote uh, meetups. So they're, you know, whether they're using Zoom, whether they're using YouTube, whether you, they're using Google Hangouts, like those options are still available. And I think a lot of the organizers um, like a lot of us were kind of in this funk for the first couple of months of the pandemic where we're like, all right, like how bad is this going to be? Like, are we going to spend the emotional energy as volunteers to radically change our process? Um, but I think uh, 
we have enough information now that it's safe to say that remote is going to be, um, you know, for the foreseeable future, how we are able to meet. Um, and so I think meetups are still a viable option um, from, from a virtual capacity. Um, I think it's also important to find mentoring opportunities. Uh, this has gotten a lot harder because nothing beats being able to sit side by side with somebody at the computer, see what they're typing, see what's happening in their terminal and be able to help them through it. And so we need to make sure that we're still prioritizing mentoring, making sure that we're still um, understanding that we as a community need to be building the kind of um, developers and technologists that we want in the workforce. Um, so finding the mentoring opportunities is a great source for that. Um, Coder Dojos are trying to figure out how to um, transition to an online event. I know there are a lot of code schools that are still going. Um, there are probably a lot of tech schools in your area that are always looking for mentors or industry professionals. Um, so this is a really great idea to um, stay involved in the community. <clears throat> All right, um, surviving your employer's transition to remote. Uh, this one was a little bit scary because, um, you know, you you can only be as successful as your environment allows. Like I mentioned earlier, you can do all the right things as a consultant. You can be the best employee in the world. Um, but if your employer is not set up um, to recognize that, you are not going to be successful. Um, and so there are a lot of things that I'm going to imagine re um, remote companies or, or companies transitioning to remote have been struggling with. Um, number one is figuring out how to shift to remote meetings, um, especially for companies that aren't very calendar based that kind of have that strategy of, hey, everybody, let's go have a meeting. And because you're there and the people are able to get those visual cues, you can just pop into a conference room that does not work in a remote environment at all. Um, managing expectations is another big thing. Um, figuring out the kind of processes and the kind of rules or procedures that um, up should apply in the workplace should apply to a remote environment. That's a huge learning curve and something that they may not even be aware of. Um, so figuring out how to do that is really important. Um, having clear and always available task management systems is another huge issue. If you're a company that is very whiteboard happy, you love having the post-it notes, that is incredibly detrimental to um, working in a remote environment and being able to visually understand where everybody on the team is and, and how they're doing. Um, effective communication, I mean, granted, whether you're in person or not, this is a huge struggle for a lot of companies, um, but it's gonna be a much harsher struggle in a remote environment, trying to figure out how to communicate effectively. Um, and then having appropriate performance evaluation systems in place. Um, how are you gauging how your employees are doing? Um, you would be shocked at how many things that we don't even realize are coming into this effect um, that are just from being an in-person environment. So um, let's kind of talk about meetings and things we should be considering. Um, first of all, they should always be on the calendar. Uh, it's not really reasonable in the current state that we're acting in uh, to think that we can just say, hey, let's have a meeting right now. And then everybody's going to be available for that. They might be away from their computer. Like, you know, it's just that's not something reasonable. And so even if this means a process change, your company needs to be getting used to scheduling meetings, having them on the calendar. And once they're on the calendar, they need to always include the necessary join links, numbers, any access codes to call. Um, I know Google uh, has gotten really good. They didn't used to do this, but now by default, if you're creating a new meeting on Google Calendar, it's going to automatically create a Hangout link for you. Um, but you know, making sure that team members know how to get meetings on the calendar and know how to populate them, like whether you're using WebEx, whether you're using Zoom, um, having a session so everybody knows how to create calendars and make sure they have those join links available is important. Um, if you are a company that has access codes protected, like make sure that those are available. There's nothing more frustrating than either running a meeting or trying to start a meeting when people can't get in and you're waiting on people or you're having to like field letting people in or getting people access codes. Um, so the more process you can build around structuring for the remote meetings, the better off you're going to be. Um, and they should always be password protected. Uh, this is also a shout out if anybody is organizing conferences. We've had um, certain anatomy bombing incidents where people like to join in and show off things that should never be shown off on camera. Um, so password protection is a good idea just to um, not have to spend a day and a half in HR training on what you should and should not do in a Zoom call. Um, don't be a tubin. I don't know what else to say about that. Another thing about meetings is they should be scheduled in consideration of the time, um, time zones of different workers. If you are in an area where you're, you know, spanning multiple time zones, be aware, like, does this cross over somebody's lunch? Is this going to be when they're, um, you know, picking up kids from childcare if they still have um, 
you know, off, off-site childcare. Um, so just be aware and kind of um, use that as a guideline. Uh, a lot of calendars will actually let you set your working hours. And so if you can do that, you can make it transparent to people when you're available to be booked for meetings and make it a lot easier um, when people are looking at different availabilities of meetings, if they can schedule you. Uh, another thing I'm going to recommend you to do is, is really up your calendar foo. Um, again, like one of the things that was really easy to do in a in-person office is, okay, well, there's a meeting starting at noon. Um, you start to see people like get up from their desks and slightly migrate over to um, the, the conference room. So even if you have your like headphones in, you're deep in coding mode, there's still this visual indicator that something's happening. And so I feel like I've seen people struggle with just not being able to own their calendar because they're not used to this process. Um, so there are a couple different things you can do. Um, one is you are able to control notifications and when they remind you. And so I think the default, for instance, for calendar, Google Calendar is 10 minutes before. And you know, for me, that is just enough for me to start focusing on a code problem and then completely space the meeting. Um, so you can snooze these reminders, you can set them to go off a minute before. Um, there are all sorts of strategies you can use for notification reminders. And if it gets really desperate, like use your phone to set like an actual timer to count down to alert you. Um, Cause it's just disrespectful to be in meetings. One of the other things I feel like people struggle with is sometimes they rely on that like little red line that indicates what actual time it is on your calendar. And just sometimes that doesn't sync correctly. And all of a sudden you're 10 minutes late for a meeting because you were paying attention to that and it wasn't updating properly. And this has happened like to people being late to meetings with me more than once. Um, so be aware of your calendar strategies and do everything you can to use technology and tools to make sure that you can get into meetings appropriately. Uh, Kind of, uh, again, with, with uh, online virtual calls, uh, we definitely need to manage expectations uh, about what's appropriate. Um, and this is something that absolutely your employer should doing, be doing, uh, but they might not have the foresight to. And so they might just have this mental model of how they think everybody should be operating. But if they haven't sat down and laid out those ex, um, expectations, uh, it can be confusing. So if you want to be proactive and, and kind of think about different things to bring up around managing expectations, um, a thing to do would be in office hours. Okay, if there was an expectation that people were at their desks at 9 a.m. Um, it, you know, in the uh, real workplace, then that should probably transition to um, being working from home. Um, establishing preferred communication mediums is key too. Like we have a ton of different tools at our disposal. Um, so make sure, you know, where relevant, um, relevant information is being relayed, whether that's Slack, whether that's email, whether that's some sort of like Microsoft Teams, um, make sure that everybody is aware of the preferred communication medium and how they're going to be reaching out to people. Um, this is something that when we were uh, with running Kansas City Women in Technology, um, as the organization grew, it started out with a lot of developers and we were very well versed in mediums like Slack. But as we brought more, you know, non strictly technical people onto the team who had a lot of really great um, other assets to offer, that wasn't a normal communication medium for them. Um, that wasn't something that they were allowed to have on their computer, for instance, during work. Um, so we needed to make sure that any important information was able to get out to people via email. You might be at a big enterprise company where email is so bad that like you're just getting bombed all the time and really the only good way to get um, communication out to people is some sort of chat program. Um, so regardless, have like this central point of, okay, anything really important is going to be relayed in, in this and this is how we're gonna communicate. Um, it's also important to establish a video call protocol. Um, do you always wanna have cameras on? Um, I tend to recommend cameras on for certain situations because you can pick up on those visual cues with people. Um, that being said, sometimes there's a lot going on where it, somebody might not be able to be on camera. Um, but this is an expectation to discuss and decide what makes sense for your team and what that protocol is going to be like. Um, I think it's also very important to call out, you know, um, what your home environment is like, what you're dealing with, because everybody is going to be coming from a different place uh, of how they're able to su support a, a remote environment at home. Um, so if it's really important for people to have complete quiet on, on calls, for instance, and they know they've got a lot of background noise, maybe it's kids, maybe it's dogs, maybe it's construction, um, you know, manage some expectations around that. Does that mean having your microphone muted by default? Um, does that mean, you know, having to have quiet hours or something like that? Um, and then something we really need to be cognizant of as well uh, is, you know, discussing childcare constraints. I do not have kids, um, but I know that 
the people who are have kids are struggling to, you know, get them online for Zoom calls for school. They have to be logged in by a certain time for their attendance to count for credit. Um, you know, they can get locked out of email accounts really easily. There are all these different things that parents are having to manage. And so employers need to be aware of that. They need to make allowances for that. Um, but we need to speak up as employees and say, hey, these are the constraints that I'm dealing with. Um, this is an expectation I have is that I might have an emergency, which means I need to step away. I will communicate that to you, but you need to be respectful that I need to go and, and handle this situation. Um, so kind of the, the idea here with managing th these expectations, especially if your employer is not um, taking the time to do it, is to sit down and say, hey, I want us to be productive. I want us to work well together. Here are things that I think are important that we need to be aware of um, so we can all, all work cohesively. Um, so when we talk about clear and always available task management, um, you know, teams are going to be most productive when they can operate autonomously. Uh, and this means they should be able to get the information they need at any time, anywhere, um, and be able to execute on their job. And so if your company has had to shift away from this whiteboard strategy to adopt a tool, like it is important to sit down and take the time to establish what that process looks like. Um, so the team can find a viable way to communicate um, that does not involve these in-person visual cues. Um, something like this is just not going to fly anymore. There's no way to update it. Um, there are a lot of tools out there. So if you're making this change, um, GitHub actually allows you to kind of create projects with different um, tracking boards. Trello, tried and true, tried and true tool. Um, Jira, I know some people love it. I know some people hate it. Um, there's a myriad of, of task management systems out there available. Um, it really does not matter. You, your team just needs to pick one, have process around it, and that way employees can get the tasks they need, get the information they need, update the, the progress of the ticket so people around them are aware of what they're blocked by or what they need um, in order to be a functioning team in a remote environment. Um, so when it comes to creating these tasks, they need to have clearly outlined requirements. Um, what is it going to take um, for a developer to start building on this task? What do they need to know to be able to hand it off, whether it's, you know, for design to verify, whether it's QA to verify, what do they need for this ticket to be considered done and testable? Um, what are any steps for completion? Um, do they need to make sure that they have unit tests written? Um, are you running, you know, pre-commit hooks to enforce linting styles? Um, you know, do they need to reference a ticket number in a pull request? Um, what are the kind of processes that you want around that you might have previously um, not had to deal with in person because you could be all in a room together reviewing code? Um, they need to have priorities or due dates. Um, we all work really well uh, with a due date in mind so we can kind of shift our work um, or if things need to be worked on based on priority, what ticket makes more sense to work on when. <sighs> Effective communication um, is something that companies will struggle with as well. Um, and the harsh truth is a, a company that sucks in communicating in person, uh, their failures are going to be magnified in a remote remote environment um, because you're losing so much more. You're losing um, organic conversations that can happen. You're learning, you're losing visual cues. Um, you're losing a lot of the ability to read body language, to read a room. Um, and so just everything is gonna be magnified. Um, so things that, that companies uh, need to be considering and you need to be you know kind of calling out, um, how is company-wide information being relayed? Uh, I know a lot of companies were in a routine where maybe they would do like a, a weekly Tuesday meeting where they would all be in a big room and, you know, people might share knowledge about different projects going on. They might update the company status. Have they transitioned that into a remote environment? Is um, everybody at the company still getting the information they need um, to be productive and be aware of the company status? Um, what are the tools used for daily communication? This goes back to managing expectations. How are we expected to communicate our process? Um, what are the things that we should be using internally? What are the things that we should be using with clients? Um, especially now that we um, you know, are working from home, we may not have a desk phone set up. Um, and I think it's really important to be proactive about things like that and say, hey, my personal phone number is not up for grabs um, in a client communication standard. What are we gonna do to deal with that communication? Um, is your team being made aware of like what the company goals are, what the project goals are, what that project looks like, um, and any changes that are happening? Um, just being very, very aware of the kind of the things we need to do. 
Um, and then what happens, for instance, if you are blocked by somebody who's away from their keyboard, um, if your community or if your company hasn't kind of established these practices of, hey, I'm going to be away or these are the working hours that I can get between, what happens when you just are completely roadblocked? Like, what's the process for that? Um, another thing I want to call out is um, the fact that Slack is not documentation. Uh, once it goes past the fold, it no longer exists. And that's just how it is. Yes, there is a search feature, but do not for a second think that it is appropriate to communicate something that somebody needs to know about changes to the code base or um, something that they need for starting up um, to, be a, to be in Slack and that be viable. Um, documentation and having good documentation is one of the most powerful things in general, but that can definitely help you with working remote. Um, in person, it's very easy to say, hey, I need help setting this project up. Somebody can sit next to you on the computer and just be like, okay, do this, do this, do this. Oh, this error, I know what that means. Do this, do this, do this. Um, so when transitioning to working remote, companies getting um, documentation around really important things like environment setup. Um, I know I, I'm dealing with a client that was not prepared for the remote shift. They were largely on site um, and they had a lot of setup process that it had to include being on their internal VPN. Um, and so they, it was very hodgepodgey trying to get um, our team onboarded. And so one of the first things we did is as soon as we figured out a way to get onboarded, we immediately documented that. Um, they loved working with us so, many, so much that they've asked us to bring on additional consultants and we've been able to jump in and say, okay, our consultants, we can get you up and running in under 30 minutes because we've documented this process about how to get your environment set up. Um, and so there's minimal overhead, there's minimal delay to getting started um, and being productive. Um, if there are any build processes or anything like maybe you're on a legacy system that you have this like really janky um, grunt set up and, and it requires all this weird internal knowledge and some sort of weird mocks, mock, mock file to run, make sure you have documentation around that. Um, if you have testing, if you have testing standards, how to get the test running, what test coverage is expected, um, that kind of thing. Uh, what your deployment process looks like. Okay, let's say I have a ticket, it's ready to go. How do I even begin to go about get, getting this deployed? Do I like, you know, I can't just run down to the next cubicle over and be like, hey, like, how do I push this? Make sure that's documented and people can have it available. Um, and then having things like company coding standards. Uh, I work primarily in Angular. And so um, a lot of the projects that I'm on, we've been tr um, transitioning to using strict mode, um, which enables a lot of specific TypeScript rules. And so that can ensure that our code is compliant. We're not um, dealing with you know, functions that, that get um, deployed that maybe uh, don't have their parameters typed and then can cause some issues there. Um, and then if you have to do any sort of migrations or their environment changes or anything like that, what does that documentation look like? So big picture, um, you want to really think about documentation and the goal is to be available to help workers execute as autonomously as possible, knowing that um, we can't just have somebody sit down at your desk and walk you through a setup process, walk you through a problem. Um, so the more time we can spend on documenting, the more time we're saving ourselves to be productive. <clears throat> All right, a scary one is um, employers having appropriate performance um, evaluation systems in place. And it's surprising how much companies um, rely on just being able to visually see a person at their desk to think that they're working. Like they may not be true, like that person may be browsing Reddit, um, but it's been very terrifying for employers to not be able to visually see people working. Um, and this is actually a joke from a remote first company that I worked with. Um, where the CEO was not a technical person and decided the way she was going to um, judge developers was the number of times a ticket had been reopened. It didn't matter if requirements weren't good. It didn't matter if there were like random um, constraints. She wanted heads on a plate if she felt like a ticket had been open, reopened too many times by the QA team. Um, so companies are just, they're not set up uh, to be able to evaluate your performance. Um, so uh, questions to ask, um, especially if you're trying to manage up and get them to think about these kind of things are, you know, who is setting the evaluation, evaluation metrics? Um, do we have somebody who is understanding of the work the, the workers are doing and figuring out how to gauge that? Um, what's their technical expertise? Um, what are the management metrics that are currently in place? Like, were there any? Were they looking at productivity? Was it just the, this kind of visual cue of, oh, well, I see this person and they seem pretty cool, so it's fine. Um, what does performance look like? You know, how is that being judged? Um, but the thing that you should be thinking about as an employee is how do you prove you're worth your paycheck? Um, and so there are a lot of things that you can do here to safeguard yourself if your employer doesn't have their shit together. And so that's being very transparent. That's being very visible. That's getting comfortable calling out the work you're doing so they don't sit down to look at your performance and say, oh, what has this person actually done? 
Um, and you know, you're going to be in situations where your employers just suck. They are not, you know, prepared to handle this working remote. They might be micromanaging. They might be expecting you to sit in a Google hangout all day. Um, so just be aware. And, you know, it is possible that, you know, we're going to be in this situation for, for the future. Um, your employer not being able to handle remote work well could be a consideration for you starting to look for a different job. Because the key thing here is you can only be as successful as your environment allows. You can be the best worker in the world, but if your company isn't set up to recognize that, to be able to recognize your performance and support you having the things you need, you just can't be that successful. <clears throat> Uh, so kind of like the, the big picture here is, you know, managing up, be proactive, um, bring ideas to the table, recommend tools, recommend solutions, um, recommend policy drafts. Something I've noticed over time is like, if you're willing to sit down and do the hard work and technically, even if it's not your job, if you draft out something in an idea and a proposal, um, you're doing a lot of hard work um, that sometimes management is scared to do. And so if you can do that hard work, you'll be surprised the positive feedback you get to that. And it can have a really positive impact for yourself and, and your coworkers. Um, so, you know, that's a big takeaway I want for you is like, you know, be proactive, figure out ways, figure out process improvements that'll make things better for everybody and then work on selling those. And throughout all this, just make sure that you're practicing self-care. Um, like a big part of the boundary setting is making sure you're stepping away from your keyboard, um, that you're maintaining some, some aspect of work-life balance. Um, I know it really sucks to not be able to like really plan vacations or, or plan family time or anything like that. Um, but there are things that, that you can do. Um, you can, like, you know, go rent a cabin in the woods, take your family, like you won't be around other people, you're still contained within your bubble. Um, but figure out ways in your life to plan things to look forward to. Make sure you're using your vacation time. Like I know it, it sucks that you can't go somewhere glamorous um, to use that, but make sure that you're taking time away, even if it is just to play video games, which is actually what I'm going to be doing like the week of Thanksgiving. Um, so I'm just going to sit down. I might like replay Mass Effect. I don't know yet, but I'm making sure to use my vacation time. Um, so a couple further resources that I want to call out. Um, there's a book called Remote, Office Not Required. Um, that's a really good one. And then Working Remotely is a free ebook. Um, so if either you just want to do more reading about how to be productive in a remote environment, maybe you're a manager wanting to do more reading about how to like create a productive remote environment, these are really great resources. Um, if you want to be super passive aggressive, if you think somebody is doing a really shitty job of being a remote manager, you could like, you know, just Amazon Prime this book to their door and see what happens. Um, but a couple things available for you there. Um, and if you are in the position that you're really, really struggling, your employer has not been able to handle this transition well and you're absolutely remote or excuse me, absolutely miserable with their approach to working remote, um, here are a bunch of resources where you can start to look for remote jobs. Um, I actually found my current job at weworkremotely.com. Um, so kind of applied um, through there and have been really, really happy because um, remote first companies, like they have these problems solved, they figured it out. Um, and so it's, it's a really great place to be. Um, but that is definitely an, an option for you. Um, these slides are available at this link here. Um, so I think we have time for a couple questions if anybody has anything. <clears throat> 